his words were, you should accept this offer um, because you've been overpaid for the last few years. Well, I find that very disrespectful, seeing mm. as I'm the most capped Harlequin of all time and my average um, minutes um, up to that point was 79. And so they're, fa they're facts. So you, well, that's, that's facts, yeah. yeah. You know, all due respect, I didn't really do anything. I don't feel like I, it was my fault. I hadn't drunk like, much, like two drinks or whatever. You know, there was other people in a worse state than me and I was just trying to mind my own business. So, but then he just switched and turned on me and I feel blinding and stuff. And, Eddie did? Yeah, 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 he just switched on me. And when I remember after that Australia game, going into the post-match, um, post-match thing with my, my family and seeing my wife and just breaking down into tears because you just put so much into it. And there was just a situation where another player decided to be funny. I think they'd added a few too many. I don't know whether I should say who the player was. It was one of your mates, old teammates. Partnering partner. Not George Cruz. No, no, the other one. <laughs> Second row? Yeah. The golden boy. No, it's not. Yeah. Marrow? Yeah. He's not a great drinker. So I left it a few minutes. I was, I was steaming. I was so angry. In this episode of Rugby Roots, I travelled north to meet up with England and Harlequins legend, Mike Brown. Mike has found himself in the city of Newcastle, far from the Twickenham Stoop, which he called home for 16 years. We caught up to discuss how life is after a shock exit from Harlequins, and we look back over his England career that spanned a decade and ended in controversy. Brownie, hometown, is it? Newcastle, for now? For now, yeah, not, not quite hometown. Um, yeah, definitely missing the actual hometown, being down south. Um, got the weather today, at least. We have. So that's one thing, but yeah, it's usually windy, rainy. The, the wind is relentless. Yeah. What's been the biggest shot then? Because we are walking around in Newcastle, I'm in a t-shirt and I've lost a bit of weight, so I'm feeling the cold a little bit, but <laughs> what's been the biggest shot from being at a club for so long, being synonymous in a 15's uh, jersey, the number 15, playing for Harlequins and then moving as suddenly as you did. It felt like there was a sudden move and then next thing you're up at Newcastle, who, no disrespect to them, are probably bookending where Harlequins were last year. Yeah, it's, it's very different. I think from the playing side, the support and structures are very different to to what's at Quinns. Um, and you learn to see that when you when you move away from Quinns, what they've done in terms of their business off the field um, to supplement the rugby side of it and then how they've built up the rugby side over the years. Um, you know, starting with people like Mark Evans, building up that business with a big game and, and how it's um, built on from there and what Conor O'Shea did. Um, people like that, it's, it is very different. Um, the lifestyle is very different, a lot quieter, less hectic up here. Less hectic? Seems yeah. quite edgy, seems quite edgy in Newcastle. It's very quiet. Really? Compared, yeah. Okay. And, you know, in, in London everyone's, you know, on their own agenda, mm. just rushing around, but here it's very, you know, quiet, laid back. Um, the weather we've spoken about, that's, mm. that's a bit of a difference. Just the wind, it, that's the thing, is the wind, it's just, relentless and send you a bit yeah the north sea yeah. the north sea wind um but in terms of the lads like they, they've been brilliant so in terms of going into a new environment and settling in that i found pretty pretty easy to be honest but i think that's that's down to them and what they've got as a playing group in terms of their culture and how they greet people and how they are as, as lads um which has been great and how i've settled in is, is uh all down to them i think Bit of history at Newcastle though. When I think about Newcastle, there's obviously one person that springs to mind, the great Johnny Wilkinson, yeah. but you've got Doddy Weir, I remember Gareth Archer back in the day, some hard forwards, but there's a bit of history there. Do they play on that history? Do they speak about that? No, definitely not, not enough. Um, and I think that's one thing that they could do here a lot better is, is, is use that, get people like that back in, Johnny, people like that. Um, to help lift and inspire, you know, the, the, the playing squad, the, the rugby community around them. Um, you can definitely use that a lot more because there is history there. There is, you know, they won, they won the league back in, I can't remember when, when it was. I'm going to guess 97. Yeah, and all those players that have come through and done great things while at the club, but also guys that have moved on. Um, so like I said, there's so much potential here. 
um, that could be used on and off the field that maybe isn't utilised at the minute. And then what about the the northerners, the hardy lads that come from the uh, the surrounding areas? I always had this thing, look, you know, been around a few clubs and stuff like that, but people from up north are always a bit different. Salt the earth, a bit harder. Have you noticed that or not? Have you noticed? You know and what, warm right? as well. Like there's a warmth around them as well. There's the, there's the warmth, and I think that's what you know I'm saying about when I first joined and how I was welcomed in. But in terms of harder and tougher, and I had all this when I first joined, um, and gritty and all this. I turn up, and most of them are quite well to, well off, well educated okay. lads who make out they're quite gritty and. From I don't know from the streets or whatever you like they like they like to call it um, hard hard nose and all this but they're not really there's been a, <laughs> there's been a shift yeah they're, they're not really Their they're dads not really and like granddads that. yeah were. you know Brett Connan he's got a bit of cash behind him yeah. Tom Penny Will Welsh Joel Hodgson all well, these they, they guys they've got rich names as well not that you yeah. want a stereotype of name they they don't seem like you know Dave from the mines. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or from the oil rigs, like Steve from the oil rigs. Radwan, he's got a bit of cash there yeah. as well. Yeah, I spoke to him um, before. He's, he's, he looked rich, like he just, he, I've, not, I've not met him personally, met him virtually. And even when <laughs> I met him virtually, I was like, yeah, there's a, a lad that is, uh, is regal in, the, in his being. But so. then I wouldn't say that to Big Trev, because he is pretty tough. Mm. <laughs> and he scares me a bit. Yeah. I can't understand what he's saying half the time. Mm, he is so. very, very thick, jawdy. Well, that's when they're proper, isn't it? Yeah, when you can't he understand the accent. That's that goes hand in hand. He's proper Geordie. Yeah, um, yeah. I wouldn't like to mess with him. Mm. God. Firstly, on the move from Quinns yeah. to Newcastle, you, you were a player, in my opinion, that kind of deserved to be a one-man club. If you wanted it to happen, for yeah. what you've given to Harlequins, we've seen obviously Chris Robshaw has gone over to America. You could still say he's a one-man club, yeah. in that sense. Um, but kind of a player that looked like he wanted to stay at Harlequins and be a one-man club and go out on your terms. Yeah. How was the emotional kind of element around coming up to Newcastle with everything that happened, but maybe having that without speaking for you, the desire to stay? Yeah. yeah so obviously, I never, I never thought I would leave Quinns. I always thought, and with what I'm doing off the field as well, I thought, you know, I'd finish my playing career there and then transition to a role off the field. They have the the model um, in the backroom staff of, of what, I, what I'm looking to do. So Billy Miller, general manager, sporting director, that's what I'm working towards. So they had that model as well and they knew I was, I was doing that and I was still, uh, in my opinion, contributing on the field as well as a player. So I was do, doing both those things. I never thought I'd move and obviously it was a big shock when I wasn't offered something. Um, and when you've been there for so long through my whole adult life, really, what, since I was 18, joined there and it's all I've known. And you said how I'm as a player, the emotion, how much I invest in the place. I don't just turn up to work, go home, switch off, constantly thinking about that place that I'm at. I care so much about it. That's, that's how I get the best out of myself on the pitch. So for that sin suddenly be taken away, it's, it, it hurts and, and uh, and it's something you're not ready for. But then when you sit back and, and you kind of move on, it's about getting that same feeling for another place, um, which, I, which I've tried to do at Newcastle because that's how I get the best out of myself and, and care about the place as much as I can in a short space of time and, and offer as much as I can on, on and off the field. And that's what I've tried to do at, at Newcastle. And yeah, it is tough when you look back and you have to step on the field against Queens, which I did the other week, yeah. which was interesting, but actually, it, it wasn't as hard as I thought it'd be. Um, because like I said, the person I am, the player I am, you just kind of part that and then you straight on to investing in, in the shirt that you've got at that time. What about leaving Quinns? There's a few different stories around how it happened. It seemed like it happened quick. I think for people watching this, a player that has grown up at the club, has given so much to the club, has won yeah. stuff, has been at times when they're struggling, and then also a player that wants to stay mm. and offer so much to the young lads, which they've all spoken about, especially in the back three, these young lads coming yeah. through, but off the pitch as well. Like, How did that transpire, the fact that you couldn't stay? Yeah, it was actually quite a long process because, yeah, it was a lot longer than probably people realised. So I, um, so just after the World Cup stuff, which I, which I didn't get picked, I started the season after that, and. Um, I ended up getting an injury, knee injury. So I had a hole in my cartilage, which 
kept me out for a long time. Um, I think it was about 11 months. So during that time of, of while I was injured, I think Guzzy maybe thought it was a good time to try and re-sign me, but also I think to do a bit with his salary cap and budget. So they wanted me to, um, so I had two years left, I think it was, and they wanted me to split, uh, or no, I had one year left. They wanted me to split it over two years. So then they had more budget for those two years. Um, and then just add a little bit on top. And I declined because it was, that, that little bit added on top was way lower than what I felt my contribution to what, when I would be fit would be um, on and off the field. And I said to him, no, I'd rather come back, show that I'm fit and, and I'll get back into the starting team and, and show that I haven't dipped in terms of my performance through injury and all that sort of stuff. So that was like a year before. So I was injured all through the COVID stuff and then came back from that COVID stuff in terms of my stats and GPS and, and then every, every performance marker, my levels of performance didn't dip off. So we were chasing, because it was in the last year of my contract, that we were chasing them to see about renew, renewing. I was still starting every week. Like I said, my performance stats were good. The team weren't doing so well at the time, but you know, I was still, my, my numbers were good. And then, yeah, I got brought in by Guzzi finally and um, after chasing for ages to be told that there was nothing for me and, and, and that was it really in a very short <laughs> to the point meeting, um, which obviously hit me quite hard and hurt a bit. I'm stunned really because I'm still playing every week. He's still picking me. And like I said, my stats, which we'd been sending them through to him in terms of my playing stats and how many minutes I'm playing and everything that they could have kind of put on my knee. My but speed. It, did, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. All that stuff. Oh, well, didn't it, yeah, clearly didn't matter. Because yeah. I think they had in their head, and I don't know if that's come from, from Guzzi, I'm, I'm yet to find out, or from someone higher up. Um, from what my understanding it came from Guzzi, I think it was an age thing, and they were trying to bring down the average age of the, of the team, which is, which is fine. But I felt there was still a place for people like me and Danny, which I think we showed in the latter part of the season. He obviously then moved on. Um, because we weren't going so well. And the, then the team, as you can see, changed the style, went back to our, our Harlequins identity and that paid off in the end, didn't it? So, um, and I feel like I had a big contribution to that. And I think that played a lot more to my strengths as well and showed um, even more that, you know, there was no dip in my performance. And then it got towards the end of the season. I think they then saw that I was contributing still as a player, if, if they thought otherwise, I don't know. but then re-offered but by that time I'd already signed with Newcastle and Dean and out of respect to them I, I, I couldn't um, tear up that contract. Could, really. it, could you have gone back though? Could like, would, Do you think there potentially was an option once Well they August came to me with an offer. Done? They came to me, oh, Quinns okay. came to me with an offer, yeah. But the way they kind of put the offer down and some of the words that were said in that in the meeting of, because I was in a meeting with a few of them, I probably shouldn't mention names and what one of the individuals said to me was um, I should just accept this offer, which was actually a lot lower than what Newcastle had given me. Not that I was about money anyway, but his words were, you should accept this offer um, because you've been overpaid for the last few years. Well, I find that very disrespectful, mm. seeing as I'm the most capped Harlequin of all time and my average um, minutes um, up to that point was 79. And, so they're, fa and they're facts. So you, well, that's facts, yeah. yeah. So I played 351 by the end of the season and my average minutes was 79. <laughs> I mean, I think I've more than paid back the club and I've been paid very well by them and really thankful for the opportunity I had, you know, playing Premiership through Harlequins and, you know, um, the good c contract they gave me, which I earned as well. But for someone to say that hurt a lot as well. And I think the fact of everything that had gone before, the fact I'd already signed with Quinns and I couldn't, I couldn't ring Dino and, and rip up a contract as much as maybe it would have been easier for me to stay and obviously still love the club. When someone says that to you, I'm done. And I'm the type of person, if someone lets you down as well, that's, it's very hard to then win me back over. Um, so yeah, it was uh, hearing things like that didn't help the situation as well. But um, yeah, so I just just um, stuck with my plan of moving to Newcastle, carried on playing and all, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately ended with that ban, which wasn't, um, didn't help. Brownie, how does a team like Harlequins go from eight or ninth in the league down the bottom to winning a Premiership in the way in which they <laughs> yeah. did, in the style of rugby? I might have answered the question. Yeah. 
how do you do that? How do you change a coach mid-season and have that much of an effect where you go on and play some of the best rugby we've ever seen and, and win the Prem? So this was actually a big learning for me for what I want to do after rugby, and probably the, the biggest in my career. It, it, was, it was simply player-led. It was players taking full control, full ownership, full responsibility, coming up to um, solutions to problems on the run, after games, all, all themselves really. So Harlequins are very lucky with the group of leaders they've got, big personalities. Um, you know, Joe Marla, Marcus Smith, um, Scott Baldwin, um, Andre, people like that. And we would, we kind of just thought enough is enough really. Like we knew what the problems were and we'd been going back and forth with Guzzi and his coaches saying, we think we should change to this. We don't like this, but what can we try this? Um, we don't think this is suiting the players we've got. And, and that's guys coming through the academy. That's guys that have been in the academy. That's guys we've brought in. And it's clearly not working because we're down near the bottom. And with the team we've got, it's not really good enough. Um, and and what was that? Was that like a more defence focused because of Guzzi's relationship with Saracens yeah. and, and in well, England? I, I don't know why, but it felt like we had just gone into that. So I remember the last game of the season before the bad season, <laughs> the season that Guzzi got um, let go, we'd got to the, was it Prem Cup final? one of the finals against Sale and literally I came off the pitch I wasn't tired I wasn't even sweating and I'm not like I'm a big sweater anyway but like I'd hardly touched the ball and it wasn't bad weather or anything it was literally just we catch it kick it okay catch it kick it turn it over kick it turn it over kick it and I was just like this is so boring so it's the Saracens well, blueprint yeah I guess so but still Saris play a, a lot more than what we were doing and it was going on in training as well so I'd send guzzy clips of us turning the ball over in training and what I'm used to and what mo the majority of that squad were used to is quick two passes away, like they're doing now, quick two passes away and we're off, mm. we're, we're playing. That's, that's where we're at the most dangerous. But we were turning the ball over, sitting on it for three, four, five seconds, set up a box heap to kick it back to them. And I just didn't understand. It doesn't fit into the, the Harlequins style identity. Like I said, that we've all grown up with the way the club's built on. Um, so we've. I was sending clips and Marcus was very frustrated at the time and I think that showed in his performances because he didn't fit into what his identity was coming through the system and didn't fit to his strengths. He was just wanted, he wanted to run and he was just getting told to kick it. Um, yeah, so we, we just thought enough's enough really and we, we, went, we went in with the coaches and said, look, we want this in the training, we want, we want to train this, unstructured, counter-attack, offloading, bring that back. We want to play this way. And then it just went on from there, really. So if, if the coaches put stuff in the session we didn't like, we said, don't put that in again. Or Marla would say, don't put that in again. And then I think it showed, I think the big learning for me was how, if the players, if you give, if you empower the players to take ownership responsibility and have it player led a lot more, then you'll get that, you'll get that rewards in how you want to play. Everyone have much more buy-in. I'm sure you had that, Saris, with the characters you had. Yeah. Get much more buy-in and- And accountability, accountability as well. Accountability is a big one, um, which which showed, because you know we turned that around. It was an unbelievable turnaround for that, for that team and um, to go on to win, win the final. But even up, even though that semi-final and final, we played Bristol and Exeter in the lead up. It was quite soon after Guzzi had gone and we, we lost those games. And the things we lost those games on, those little turning points in games, we actually got together as a leadership group ourselves and talked about those situations and what we could have done better. And actually it paid off in the, the semi-final and final because those situations kind of arose again. We talked about it and you know they, they came back against Bristol and, and then beat Exeter near the end as well. So it, it just shows how strong that, that um, player-led environment can be. Brandon, let's talk about the final. We briefly went through Harlequin's end of season fight to get to the top. How was it for you, mate? Because you looked at the emotion around the team, the way that you did it in the semi-finals in the lead-up, and to get that red card and not make it. With everything you've kind of been through in the sense of sporting terms and the highs and lows that Harlequin's knew that you were leaving, was it bittersweet or was it bitter? It's hard to put it into words, really. Like. It was it was tough. It was a tough six weeks um, because you feel like your whole world is over because you've what invested how many years um, playing there and you know you're leaving and 
and you want to leave in the right way, to be, for that to be taken away uh, from me was, was tough. And while you're in it, it feels like the worst thing in the world, doesn't it, um, that's going on. But I guess now when you take a step back, it's kind of like, it's not the worst thing in the world, but yeah, it hurt at the time. And trying to be supportive as much as I could, um, yeah, it was tough because you just want to be involved, don't you? You know what it's like. It's, it's hard to put, it's hard even yeah, to explain well, I, it. Especially now when you, still, it. you still play, it probably is quite, you know, roster when, when you look yeah. at it. I think but, by the semi-final final, it was just like I was a fan in the end yeah. and just, just screaming for them as a fan. And it, But it was nice that I got managed to get on the pitch because the COVID protocols said I wasn't allowed to go on the pitch. So I kind of, <laughs> so last five minutes, I kind of worked my way down the stadium because they put us in like these two, they put us in a middle tier and at Twickenham from the middle tier, you have to go back out the stadium to come back in. They obviously did that for a reason. So we weren't around the general public. So X to over one side and we were next to them, kind of penned in. So I snuck out around the stewards that had kind of penned us in last few minutes, I think, worked my way out and back in. And I got to the side of the pitch. So if, 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 this is the, if this is the pitch here and we're stood on the side, tunnel's right there and the bench is there. And I'm like giving the lads on the bench a bit of a nod. And literally as the final whistle went, I literally launched my bag, jumped over the thing, stewards like trying to grab me, just sprinted, um, managed to get on the, on the pitch. And then it was so nice for, for, for Domers and, and Steph to give me that opportunity to lift the, the trophy with them. Um, yeah, how was that? Because I mean, I've been in teams before and this isn't me being in comparison to you. I got a lot of shit when I was at Saracens. I got on for 20 seconds. It was my last year and I was like, you know what? It's the last time ever I got in the front and centre and I've got my hands on the trophy and people are yeah, taking yeah. the mitt, calling me John Terry. Very different for you though, because of your <laughs> I still get history. that. I still oh, get do, it from you, Newcastle, especially at the start of the Newcastle okay. lads were, were, were saying that in a, in, a, in a funny way. And I was like, I don't give a shit. So that's what Literally. it felt like. Yeah. Well, like on the lead up, I was speaking to my missus about it and she was like, I was obviously wallowing in self-pity and, and de not depressed, but like, you know, really down about it all. And, oh, poor me, poor me. And she was like, look, if you get on the pitch, you milk it for who we were, for what, what you've done for how many years and what you've put in helping the team to get there as well. Um, you've contributed, so you should. Not that I thought I'd be standing at the front giving it a bigger with, yeah. the, with the trophy. The only thing I was missing was, was my kit. Um, should have put that on as well. But Would have been hilarious. But I obviously wanted to be there for when they did lift it and, yeah, and, and, and enjoy it that way. And Martin Landasia as well, he gave me his medal because obviously at the time you only get the 23, get medal, get medals. Um, they sorted the rest of the guys out a few weeks after, but at the time he gives me his medal, which was an amazing touch mm. as well. So I actually got to wear medals and a medal, <laughs> yeah, but the literally works. the cup, everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you know it, was, it was still nice when you sit back and think about the contribution you've done for, what was it, 17 years plus the lead up to there to getting us back to where we should have been a lot quicker than that, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it was, it was nice. Brownie, let's talk about England and that journey that you went on, rightly so. Many caps for England in the 15 jersey. 2007, I'm right in saying? Was my, yeah, my debut, yeah. But it yeah. didn't all go to plan, did it? From what <laughs> my researchers tell me, oh, from what I God. remember? It was, it was an absolute tour of hell. Um, so. At the time, that was the first season that there was the playoffs. And obviously they booked the tour a few years in advance, not taking that into account. So we didn't have the players from the top four teams come with us. So <laughs> we were missing, back then it was what, a lot of Leicester and Wasp players in the England set up. So especially in the fours, we were missing loads. So we were already at a disadvantage and we were playing the team that went on to win the World Cup. So they were quality at the time. And a load of new guys were, were in, like myself, getting debuted. To, to, to add more um, hell to it, it was, uh, we all had food poisoning. So I had food poisoning. Stretz was in the hospital with food oh, poisoning. Oh, where from? Where was it from? Oh, I don't know, but it was bad though. Oh. So he, he got found, he got found on his bathroom floor, gasping for air, <laughs> kind of being sick as well by the doctor and ended up in hospital. That was just before the first. And he's, test. An, he's a northerner as well, is it? He calls himself a northerner. Yeah, he's not. He's yeah, not he's not. Proper. No, um, Stretz is not a northerner. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was it was quite bad, and I ended up getting it a day before the first test, my, my first game. So going into there, I felt awful anyway. The nerves didn't help. I was dry wrenching on the field on occasions. Um, Pasky, the, I don't know if you know him, the physio, yes. Bill Pask, 
he's been around for, for many years. He, he, he always reminded me how he came on at one point after I'd been smoked by Berger and uh, De Villiers trying to run a short line which worked in the Premiership all season. <laughs> Did not work at that level. They were proper. Yeah, that team was proper. Absolutely smoked. It? And he, he, he always reminds me the moment he comes on, peel me off the turf and I'm dry wrenching. But he's trying to get me back in the game and I'm just like, oh. Mercy. Um, this is test match. Yeah, this is test match. Proper rugby now. Um, welcome. Yeah, so it was tough and we got absolutely battered because they were on a way different level to us. So yeah, that was it. it was a tough introduction to uh, international rugby. Um, managed to just about be fit for the second test. That didn't, that went pretty much the same sort of way. Um, they battered us again and that was my first couple of, uh, couple of uh, introductions to um, test rugby on a tour of hell. Um, but, yeah, suited, sure. but suited to test rugby, your skill set, and you look now. It wasn't now, then. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> well, it didn't, it didn't feel like oh, it. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's the one team, actually, the one team, South Africa, yeah. in terms of how they play. I think it was a good It was a good eye-opener of what I needed to do to get to the level if I wanted to get back there. And what was that? <sighs> Just reading of the game, um, high ball skills, um, being able to cope with the pressure, skills under pressure, just how, how quick everything moves, how strong everyone is, how gaps that would be there normally in the Premiership, like the one between De Villiers and, and Berger, close very quickly mm. <laughs> when you try and run them. Um, yeah, everything just moves quicker and is, is a lot harder and um, the speed of the game's higher. So it was just an eye-opener to that. And yeah, I think it was perfect in my development, thinking I was good enough for that level and I definitely wasn't. So. Um, no, it was, a, it was a good learning experience anyway. And then some people are suited to international rugby. Some people can play Premiership all their career, carve up, not get picked, or not have that something that coaches necessarily want or need. We've, yeah. we've seen that with a number of players, uh, Don Arwen being one at Exeter. Just yeah. at the top of my head, Sam Simmons, I know he's back in the fold. But there's a certain skill set, isn't there, in terms of being able to operate, you mentioned under pressure, but your skill set specifically in the air, yeah. and not to draw comparisons to a Freddie Stewart that's playing now, but I'm going to. It's such a skill. Like, I mm. look at that, and I'm like, I think that that is one of the hardest things yeah. you could probably do in sport, especially a contact sport as well. So just talk us through what it's like doing that, what it's like being world-class in that field, and how important it is to have that kind of skill that we now yeah. are watching Freddie Stewart carry on in that 15 jersey. Yeah, it's definitely if it's definitely a, a skill with how international rugby is, how it's an important skill with, with you know the level you need to be at for, for now because the kicking is so prominent in, in the game. And it came from a lot of hard a, a lot of years of hard work because I when I was trying to break into the Quinns team at the time with Andy Friend and Dean Richards, my my high ball was was awful. Like I'd probably catch one in five. So they brought me in and, and you know, in no uncertain terms, told me that it was not good enough. And if I wanted to play for Harlequins at fullback, it had to, had to um, be a lot better. So it started from then really. And I just pulled Gavin Duffy aside, and, who was uh, Harlequins 15 at the time. And he did Gaelic football background. He was unbelievable at high ball. And all credit to him, he you know, took me under his wing and, and helped me get to the, the level I'm at now. And then it just, it's just repetitive catching eyeballs. I actually hate catching eyeballs now because I've done it so much. It's just uh, sometimes I wish they just ban overhead kicking like in five-a-side football. Oh, they um, won't. Oh, they, they won't. They won't. Um, yeah, and it, it's just something that you just have to fully commit to, do, to doing it and that, that's probably the type of player I am. I just, I just give everything to whatever I'm doing. So we spoke about it earlier, what shirt you're in. I've, fully give everything I've got to that shirt and my performance, that's how I get the best out of myself. Um, and it's the same with that skill, I think. You can do all the technical work and you can do all the kind of catching you want as much as it helps if you don't fully commit to doing it. Um, be brave, be decisive. Well, be brave's the one. That's the one where I'm like, because you're at speed, you can't see what's going on. There's been a load of law changes yeah. around, uh, you know, protecting the, the catcher yeah. and, you know, the, the player that runs onto it is generally the one that can cause the issue. There was a collision a couple of weeks ago, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. Me, yeah me and Lewington, wasn't Yeah, it? that yeah, was yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Lewington. Like, yeah. you look at uh, two players, I mean, he's good under the high yeah, ball Yeah, we as just well. both went for it, and that's the thing, you just got to both, you just got to commit to it and try and win that airspace as much as possible, and that's kind of what I learned um, as, I, as I went along. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah. Um, 
you, you're inevitably going to get those big collisions, so you kind of have to get your head around that and just just go for it and not not think about have it. Have you ever looked down? Have you ever like and then pulled out of it? No, never. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, my worst two head injuries have come from kicks. One was a chip where I was going to go for it, and the last minute he got in front of me. It was Massey from Italy, mm. and then I dipped, and he just boom, straight into my head. Um, and I was out for a few minutes and, yeah, missed a few games off the, off the back of that for England. And then my other one was again going for the higher ball, didn't think anything of it, and we both were up there and he kind of pulled me down and landed on my head again out for a few minutes. So they were probably my worst head injuries I've had has come from that, so. Um, but you just don't think about it, I think. You just, you just go for it and um, I think I've managed to make, make it a super strength of mine and Luckily, it's, it's paid off because that's so important in, in international rugby now. And I do wish I had that extra five inches in height before you make the gag in yeah. height that, that Stewart's got because he's six foot five. But he's unbelievable on the high ball, isn't he? He's, he's, yeah. Um, yeah, he's class and big old unit. And he, so. How good is he? Let's, I know we're segueing slightly. It's easy to sit there and say he's one of the greatest under the high balls. Yeah. He's only played a handful of games for England. Again, we were talking a little bit about Rugby, and we we're talking about how England are playing at the minute. I thought they looked like they're playing all right, which they're obviously not because people have been coming back at me. But you just I'm want a job with Eddie, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> Eddie, I'll get you in. I'd last, I'd last, I reckon, a week if I was lucky. Um, how good is Freddie Stewart? So you're looking at him going up, he's wearing the jersey yeah. that has been synonymous with you for so many years as well. Yeah. How good is this kid? Yeah, I think he's, I think he's well on his way to be talked about as world class mm. if, if he isn't already. Um, when, when, as a fullback myself, when I look at other fullbacks, I firstly look at how good they are and their fundamentals of a fullback because you look at other positions, no point having a hook if you can't throw under the highest pressure at the highest level. So when I look at fullbacks, their high ball skills, their, their decision making from the back, because if you can't make good decisions from the back, you're going to put your team under pressure. And then all the highlight stuff will come off the back of that, which I think people nowadays, especially with social media and stuff, they look at those highlight stuff first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Oh, he made one great run. Oh, he must have been unbelievable today, where actually he's dropped two high balls and thrown three crap passes and he put his team under pressure by running up from his own sticks. So when I look at Freddie, he's got all those fundamentals locked down, in my opinion. He makes great decisions from the back, doesn't put his team under pressure. He can run, kick uh, or pass um, on his counter attack. He's got the physique 100% like way better than, than this. <laughs> Significantly and better than me then. Same height, but yeah. Same yeah. height, but he, uh, he, he looks rig. unbelievable. Um, so he's strong, he's powerful. He adds that 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 um, that strength in the England backline that maybe missing when Manu's not there, uh, joining the line. Um, he's got a good boot, and he's great one-on-one tackler. So, the yeah, it's real. So, I think so. I yeah. think so. Yeah, and I think they, maybe they've missed that for the last couple of years. Mm. You know, Elliot playing out of position. Um, I, th I think some pe sometimes people think you can just chuck anyone at, at fullback, and it's once you're back there in the wide open spaces and the ball's getting pumped, pumped onto you, especially when a team knows it's something you don't really like, it's, it's dark time, it can be dark time. Mike, let's talk about the England period from 2014 to 2016. And why I want to talk about that period is, it was an amazing time for you in 2014. You got player of the tournament, the World Cup, not so much. And then there was a change of guard with Eddie Jones yeah. coming in there and he made not wholesale changes. He did make changes, but he allowed players to kind of organically finish their career, which I thought was quite good of him in, in, in some parts, uh, but not for other players as well. have got a different relationship with that. But that three year period, if you can just kind of go through that in the lead up to the World Cup being, yeah. being in England in 2015. Yeah, so Stuart obviously took over and, and that gave me my opportunity after a long time being out to get back in. I think some coaches maybe had a perception of, of who I was and what I was like. And luckily I had hit, uh, Stuart in, in uh, the Saxons. So I was in the Saxons with him. So he knew really what... He knew you were a good bloke, is wow. what you're saying. Well, that's he, what he it is, knew, isn't it? Because I he think... knew what I was about and yeah, he liked yeah. things, attributes of my game yeah. that, that um, maybe you can't see when, you know, you, you haven't had me hands on sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I was lucky in that respect that he, then, he, then he took over. And what I liked about... Um, you know, playing in, in Stuart's team and, and, you know, with Andy Farrell and Mike Catt is they just allowed me to, 
to be me. They, they never said, oh, you need to play this way or you, you need to start doing this in the games. Or they just let me go out and, and put my super strengths on the field. And, um, you know, I never felt like I had to be a certain way as a player or anything. So I think then that allowed me to, to put the performances that I, that I did in. Yeah, and I, I, I loved it as well. And I, th I thought we were, we were on a really good trajectory um, into that World Cup. I think there was things in that build up for, for the World Cup that, and I, I'm sure Stuart said it before, and you know, he's a very honest man that we, we could, have, could have and should have done differently in terms of our preparation and, and things like that. But that's, that's not an excuse. We didn't produce on the day when it counted the most, um, for whatever reason. Pressure, expectation. Yeah, do you How know much what? was I on your mind as, I a, didn't as feel the pressure. At, I didn't feel pressure at all. I just loved every second of it, apart from losing to Wales <laughs> and then to Australia. <laughs> Um, but I loved it, like I loved it because it was my first World Cup. You know, I've, I, I felt in, individually as in my preparation, I felt like the, probably the best physically I, I'd ever felt. Like I felt in great condition and that was down to a lot to do with Margot Wells, who I've trained with pretty much my whole career now. Because um, I did a lot, Stuart let me do a lot of stuff um, alongside their stuff during camp with her. So I felt like a million dollars and just loved the whole spectacle and being your own country and the build up and that first game against Fiji. Oh, it was, um, it was unbelievable, like the atmospheres and stuff like that. And then obviously, you know, it started pretty well for us against Fiji and then, you know, cheeky man in the match as well. Um, but then obviously, yeah, we, um, we had a disappointment against Wales. That hit, that hit us hard. I think from then on, we, the we, were, we were struggling mm. because when you lose a game like that, I don't think you recover and you can't recover that quickly. Could so, the lads feel it? And I say the lads, obviously Chris Robshaw being skipper as well. Yeah. But how much were were you feeling it? I know social media wasn't as big back then, but it felt like everyone yeah. was, was on England we, there. Yeah, they almost could, wanted England to fall. Yeah, the, well, people want England to fail anyway, if we were honest, and you can answer that better than I'm a quarter others. English. I'm a quarter English. <laughs> But you know, when teams play England, it, it's one of their biggest games. Like if, whether they admit it or not. Oh, they do. It, Everyone it, admits yeah, it. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's it's true. You know, they, they'll never. Even if they're losing, they'll never give up. Um, and when they when they come out, they come out firing. And you know, but we had Wales in a good position. We were doing well. We we started off really well. Things were going well, and you know, they they'd lost a few for injury, but. Again, they're playing England, they're not going to give up. And then they started to get momentum and things started going their way. A few refereeing decisions. And that's not an excuse, that's a fact because, you know, we had the refereeing report after. There's no point in saying sorry to us after, is there? But, you know, the refereeing decision didn't go our way. And then, you know, they end up getting breakaway tries and full credit to them. They showed their spirit and their fight to stay in it and then win it at the end. And they fully deserved to, to get that win. But, yeah, that put the pressure right on us then because Australia, they were in unbelievable form. And if we're honest, we were never going to beat them because the way they were performing, the players they had in that team, the experience, the energy they had in that camp because they were going well, whereas we were very much trying to pick ourselves up. So we were always scrambling in that last game. And yeah, it was, it was, um, that was hugely disappointing. I remember after that Australia game, going into the post-match, um, the post-match thing with my, my family and seeing my wife and just breaking down into tears because you just put so much into it. Um, again, going back into the person I am, I put so much into that shirt and that preparation and, and that, those games, you know, it just all comes out once. And, um, yeah, that was, that, was, uh, that was a tough moment. So, yeah, and then, and then there's the last game against Uruguay. <laughs> you know, that last week was just hell. Honestly, yeah. I can't even tell you, like, we you could see that, and I remember. We just walked out to train, and everyone yeah. was just like, what's the point? You, you pick yourself up because you're playing for England, and we're very lucky to do that, but, but we were just sure like, why, when really... It wasn't even that, we were out. So it was like, we tried to have a bit of fun just chucking the ball around, but no, no one wants to play rugby at that moment, do they? They want to just go home and sit in a house and wallow, and I don't know, it's just, yeah, it's just a, a tough time, tough moment to be in. And, yeah, that was that was a shame, really. Um, but you know, life goes on, doesn't it? And, yeah. So and, the uh, aftermath, the cry for help goes out. Eddie Jones comes in. Yeah. Are you thinking there's another opportunity 
World Cup in four years' time. Where's your head? Hundred percent, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Um, yeah, I definitely thought I'd make the next cycle, and um, was looking forward to Eddie coming in, another coach to be to, that comes in with the experience and his rep. I remember someone saying to me, uh, "The holiday was very much over for us," and, he, and they weren't wrong. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was an eye opener into what is what is required at the highest level in terms of preparation and doing your extras and recovery and all those little bits. The way Eddie sees the game, learning from that and learning from little things, different scenarios and what how you could deal with different things was a massive eye opener. Um, in terms of what, like intensity, because I think this is a, a really interesting point because there is this story, I hate saying the word narrative, but it is a narrative around Eddie Jones and changeover of coaches yeah. and how hard he drives. Yeah. So is it standards? What is it? What's what's he driving? What what is it? Yeah, it's standards, it's it's on you all the time in training, it's in terms of your standards and your work rate and yeah, um, and your effort. I just remember I remember the first meeting he uh, he gave us. I think our ranking was like one or two above Fiji or something or or Japan and he was just basically told us that was unacceptable, I think. Why did he give you that ranking? No, it was our world. It was the it, ranking. It was the ranking. I think we were like two above Japan or something. Because it was after the World Cup. After the World Cup. And he was like, you're currently, I don't know, seventh in the world. Japan are like eighth. They're, they're tallest locks, like six foot. It's fucking unacceptable, basically saying that. Um, that was the first meeting. And we were just sat there like, oh my Positive. God. Yeah, good start. And then he abused Haskell a little bit, which was quite funny, but also, then you got a sense of his uh, sharp tongue and stuff like that. Obviously, Haskell laps that up. But and then it was just um, it was just an eye opener into what you need to succeed at the highest level, I think, and how intense it was going to be. So we had us up like 5 a.m. to do team walkthroughs. Sometimes he wouldn't even turn up, but he was apparently he was watching on this. So in the indoor facility, they had this camera like CCTV, and it was linked up to the analysis room. And he was watching on there just to see how we react if, react if no coaches turned up and if we do it ourselves and if he could pick out people that were messing around stuff and like did that. did you do it? Who was messing around? No, Who no, no. I think, I think Dills kind of knew what was going on. Okay. Dylan Hartley knew what was going on. So he had everyone in, in check. But he was just on you, you know, bottles on the floor, um, onto you about GPS. So he's big on GPS. So if, if you haven't run enough high speed meters or distance or whatever, he's measuring on you on at that point. He'd be like, why the f are you not putting in training? Uh, Marlon Yard, for example, when he was in camp, he basically stood on the wing during the whole of one session. And during that session, we'd seen foxes hanging around the bushes. So from then on, he was called the fox because he was just hanging around the bushes with the fox, foxes doing nothing. Um, so, he was, so Eddie just called him the fox the whole time. He has a way with people, Eddie Jones, it seems, not having worked with him, but having spoken to people that have worked with him. He knows how to push people's buttons. Apparently he rides Tom Curry quite hard. Yeah, with Haskell, he could give him banter. Yeah. You know, with Young Z, he, he can be a certain way with him and give him a little bit of banter. Is that one of his big skills? Because again, from the outside looking in, there's a big turner of coaches. You know, what's the yeah. environment like? You know, you mentioned about being at Harlequins, and you know, I speak about it as well, being player led. But if he's running the show, Two-prong question. Yeah. How much is he putting on the players? And is the environment one in which people are fl flourishing with how he manages players? Yeah, so in terms of in terms of the staff, the turnaround of the staff, he's hard, he's hard on the players and then he's another level for the staff. So I can understand why people don't last very long there, because it's it must be um, must be tough being um, part of his his uh, his his um, staff. Um but yeah, I think he does in a way, I think when he's got his starting group he's really good at, with them I'm not so sure when you're not in that group how well he is how, how good he is at dealing with that and I think there's a bit of maybe confirmation bias and that's why I've not picked you so if you do that once I'm going to be on to you about that and miss all the good stuff or is he as good at, at motivating people that aren't maybe in his thoughts to being his selected 23 or 15 or whatever, I'm not sure. Um, but in terms of his knowledge, his rugby knowledge, it's like he is a smart, clever, 
rugby intelligent guy, I think. Um, so you, you can learn a lot from him that way about the game and stuff like that. And I think in terms of building an environment that's very intense, geared towards high performing, I think, yes, he's good. Maybe there's a level where, and I think they, ha I think he might have the level okay now because they seem to enjoy the environment and where maybe we maybe didn't as much as they do now. I think there's a lot, I think there's a much tighter group with what they got with England now um, from what comes out of the camp and I'm not in there so I don't know, you know, with the Genji and people like that, I think they get a lot more enjoyment than maybe what we did as a group um, from being in that environment, which is great to see. Um, so I guess it's just about getting that balance and you know, he's the expert, he's the England, he's the England top man. So, um, yeah, only he can answer whether he's getting the best out of those players. Arguably, maybe not at the moment because the last two seasons that they haven't done done too well. So hopefully they can turn it around because there's so much talent in that group. What happened in 2019? Yourself, Ben Teo, something that I wouldn't have put Mike Brown on yeah. the beers, confrontation off the pitch which resulted in not a storm, but kind of hit the media and did the rounds around yeah. rugby players. Yeah, it was unfortunate really, and it? Um, you've been on enough socials to know things like that happen. So we'd had, we'd had a really intense two week period in Treviso for our World Cup camp. You know, the training was the toughest I've ever experienced in my life. And we hadn't done too much in terms of socially away from it. So at the end of those two weeks, at the end of that two week block, Rightly so, we had a social um, just um, at a beach club uh, by the beach during the day. Yeah, and, uh, and some guys had, had a few too many. I think I'd had two drinks. Like, I'm not a big so you're drinker. Not, you're not a big drinker? No, I'm not right. a big drinker, drinker at all, really. Like, in the season, I don't really drink. But then, you know, we'd worked hard. Everyone was having a, having a few. So I think I maybe had one or two. And there was just a situation where an, another player decided to be funny. I think they'd had a few too many. I don't know whether I should say who the player was. It was one of your mates, old teammates. Oh, I was just trying to think. <laughs> Forward or back? Forward. Not great, not a great drinker. Billy? No, it wasn't <laughs> Billy, it wasn't Billy. Partnering partner. Not George Cruz. No, no, it's the other one. <laughs> Second row? Yeah. The golden boy. No, it's not. Yeah. Marrow? Yeah, he's not a great drinker. But really? He, yeah, but so he decided it would be funny to basically go around whacking people, just in a fun, jovial way. But he's a big guy and he's been drinking. Like, he hit me very hard there, like, hard enough to have a massive handprint. Okay. So, and I'm sitting there just, just with a few lads just chatting, um, having a good relax for the first time in a good few weeks. And he's come up behind me and whacked me. He's done it to a few people, but I didn't really take kindly to that. So I left it a few minutes because I was, I was Steam, I was so angry. Um, so I left it a few minutes, calmed down. I just pulled him aside and I said, Look, like, you know, I know we're having a good time and that, but I don't really appreciate that. I think it's disrespectful. I just don't do it again. And it was fine. Me and Mara were fine. But I think Ben, being the wind up he is, kind of cottoned on to that. And then for the rest of the time, decided he would kind of try and wind me up, I think. And he'd had a few as well. He likes his drink. So he kept trying to decide, oh, yeah, oh, Brown, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything. Oh, tough guy on the pitch, just, just messing around. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was a case where he tried to do it and he kind of fell over, over this table, knocked a load of drinks over. And Joe Marchant and Don Brand, who were new to the, to the uh, environment at the time, just stood up and was like, oh, Ben, what, what are you doing? Like, just leave him alone. We're just trying to- Teammate. We're just trying to chill out, like, just leave him alone. And I don't think he liked that because two young guys. So it kind of wound up a bit and he went away and he was just, he was just I think he was a bit annoyed because he'd been shown up by two of the young lads. So then we left um, just early, uh, uh, early evening, late afternoon. We, we all walked back because we always left as a, as a team uh, to go on the coach. Where's your mind now? Ah, chilled? Um, pissed off? Yeah, I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. But I can hear him in front of me in a group of lads. So I'm with a couple of us and then there's a big group and he's going, oh, I'm going to knock him out on the bus. I'm going to do this to him. I'm going to do that to him. And I was like, Tia, I'm stood right behind you. I was like, Tia, I'm stood right behind you. Like, what's your problem? And then he kind of walks, I'm carrying a walk and he turns around, comes and walks to me. Um, we kind of meet and then he just swings for me, clips me nicely there and he's, he's handy with his fists as well. I mean, he spends more time doing his boxing on the side of the pitch than training on it. If anyone who knows Tio, he's not, not the biggest trainer. So he does a lot of boxing and he's a big lad and he clipped me 
well and then it kind of we just kind of came together but everyone do dove in and broke it up and you we throw had, any? I didn't even get I didn't get near him I don't think I mean by the time he'd thrown it to us coming together mm. it was pretty much over because everyone was in there and just pulling it apart yeah. and that's basically what happened and obviously Eddie didn't get, take kindly to that and it was it was a shame really like he he kind of tried to make that the reason why I wasn't going to the World Cup and he didn't select me he hadn't spoke to me from the moment it happened uh, to later on and it was a shame I, I felt I felt a bit let down with a few lads not saying well actually Mike didn't really do much there like it was instigated by other people didn't feel like anyone had really had my back but I think people were kind of looking after themselves close to a World Cup and I kind of understand that and that wasn't the reason why I didn't go to the World Cup I think it's just easier for Eddie to put it on that because I'd been kind of getting pushed out of the team as this, that season had gone on. Um, so it was a timing, really, just to kind Yeah, of I think it was it just easier for him to... So then a few days later, when he's ringing around people to say they're not involved, he kind of puts it on, on that. And I, was, and I said to him, look, I understand selection is what it is, but don't put it on that. You haven't even asked me what happened. You know, all due respect, I didn't really do anything. I don't feel like I, it was my fault. I hadn't drunk I, much, like two drinks or whatever. You know, there was other people in a worse state than me and I was just trying to mind my own business. So, but then he just switched and turned on me and effing blinding and stuff and just kept putting on that. And I asked him, you know, who... Eddie did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just switched on me and, yeah, I was, yeah it wasn't nice because it's just be a man and say, what is the reason I'm not getting picked? Don't try and put it on that because it's not that. It's pretty clear and obvious it's not that. And then I asked him to, to, to tell me what he thinks happened because he said oh my security guards were there because we had security they told me what happened I was like okay well let me see what they've said has happened because he said he had written reports or whatever wouldn't, wouldn't give me that and then call, he, he said he, he said who the f do you think you are because I was kind of going back at him and he doesn't like that um, so that was a shame it ended up like that um, but I wanted clarity on why I wasn't getting picked not not made up excuse so that was a shame and but with Ben Teo, it's fine. Like, it is what it is. Like, it happens on social. You've been on a, enough of them. Um, I didn't think he would be like that, being pretty decent mates with him. But it's not like I hold a grudge against him. Um, and it wasn't the reason I didn't go to the World Cup, you know. Well, we could say that it's Mauro Toji's fault. That we you could say go, that, yeah. <laughs> you go to the World Cup in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, things happen on socials, don't they? And, you know, when, when I confronted him about what he was doing, he stopped and he was fine, so... You know, it is what it is. It's not, it's not the reason I didn't go. Whatever the reason was, I didn't do enough during that season or I wasn't showing enough of what Eddie wanted to see, you know. So um, I just think he, instead of putting on a reason it wasn't because of, be a man and say, no, it was because of that. And then I'd be like, I can say, no, I don't agree. But, you know, you can have a back and forth about that. But yeah, it was a bit, of a bit, it's just a shame it ended like that and and then it gets out in the press and that's the reason why you're not going and it's not. And then my name gets tarnished when I don't feel like I've done much. That's the hard thing, I think, because everyone sees just that story. Yeah. Um, and you don't, you don't feel at the time you can really uh, put your point of view across and say what actually happened because there still might be a slimmer of hope that some, someone might get injured and you might get called up and, and things like that. So you have to just take it on the chin and keep quiet, which is the hard thing, I think. Ups and downs, more ups than downs. Yeah. Experienced the move from Harlequins to Newcastle. Give me the dream scenario for you going forward as you come, where you're in your prime. Well, firstly, for me, my body still feels great. Like, there's, there's not been a dip in performance in terms of my playing performance and what I'm producing in terms of what they look at with data and stats, GPS, how much I'm training in the week. There's been no drop off in all those things. So if I was just to retire now, I'd, I'd definitely regret it because I still feel like I've got a lot of contribution of playing at, at Newcastle. I was, I'm playing every week and I played just as many games this year as I had last year and training just as much. So I um, still feel great. So for me, it's about finding another club. Probably three things that I want going forward for my career. The first is going somewhere with real ambition. So being in an environment that has ambition and, and that's on and off the field, I think, um, as a club. I want to be part of that. Um, I think it's going somewhere with a good playing style. Um, what I mean by that is a, a playing style that contributes my super strengths and what I can bring. You know, coming from Quinns, that's a offloading, that's counter-attacking, that's transition. Um, yeah, being involved in, in that sort of 
a, a good style of attack um, club. And I think, I think lastly and probably most important at this stage of my career is being somewhere where I feel like I can contribute on the non-playing side, because I feel, still feel I can contribute as a player, but giving back in a, a non-playing capacity. So I'm doing my Masters in Sport and Directorship because I want to get to a Sport and Director level or Director of Rugby or Technical Director in other sports, it's called. Um, so gain experience in that, but also give back to the club that I'm at. So working with, I, I know, I don't know, uh, 18s to academy to young lads in the first team with those outside backs, trying to give them some of uh, the experience that I've got, some of the knowledge I've got as a back three player. Um, I'm going to start doing my coach badges next year, so gain experience in coaching while also trying to give back to them, um, mentoring off the field. Anywhere I can really help and develop that club I'm at by helping their young lads really. Um, you know, help with their pathway. I'm not going somewhere to block a young player's pathway, but hopefully help develop it and contribute. Because I've already started doing that with people like Louis Liner at uh, Harlequins. I think I've helped uh, Radwan at Newcastle a bit as well. And yeah, just to do that somewhere. So those are the three things that motivate me and that's what I'm looking for as a club. And yeah, it's a tough, tough market at the moment with the salary cap dropping and things like that. There's a lot of good players um, still waiting for, for something. So hopefully that, that comes. Um, hopefully someone sees the value in me on and off the field. Um, yeah, so, so that's what I'm looking for, really. Mike Brown, it's been a pleasure being up in the Toon on a sunny day, chatting to you about your career and wish you well going forward, mate. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. <laughs>